Okay, let's begin. Uh, thank you very much for watching Talk with Experts. So today we have the great pleasure to have um, Dr. Paul Mantam, Jackie, to share with us his insights and research on uh, the internet, the AI in the workplace, and the interaction between employees and machines. Nowadays, I guess it's becoming really relevant to every one of us that the artificial intelligence, its application has been really emerging to almost everywhere in the workplace, which of course generated lots of concerns, but also lots of promising areas of development. So before we begin, let me give you a brief introduction of Jackie. Jackie is an assistant professor at the Terry College of Business in University of Georgia. Um, and he received the PhD in management from Texas A&M University in the United States and earned both MPhil and um, BBA from Lina University in Hong Kong. So let's jump start to what we are going to discuss today. So first of all, when I browse your CV, when I look at your CV, it has a really amazing CV, uh, track, track record, I should say. So early, early years, you focused on ethical behaviors, employees' ethical behaviors in organizations. And in recent years, you focus on the human, non-human interactions at work. Um, for instance, the most recent articles you published in Journal of Applied Psychology looked at the processes and consequences of um, interacting with artificial intelligence, especially the work and after work consequences. So why not we begin with this article and this study? What motivated you to study this topic? And uh, any interesting findings you would like to share with us from the study? Yeah, thank you so much for the very kind introduction, Vincent. Um, we know each other way back, so um, it's my really pleasure to talk to you on this, uh, all these kind of matters and share my insights and knowledge, hopefully. So um, my stream of research on human or human inter interactions was actually inspired by my um, industrial experience. Um, so after graduating from my MBU degree, where I actually met you, um, I, I went on to work in the industry for a few years. And, and one of my job is actually working in an investment bank and where I had the real person, in-person opportunities to interact with artificial intelligence software and systems. And, and that's where, um, that was actually 2017, that was so many years ago. And at that time, no one talks about AI, but investment bank was such a competitive context and industry, and they started using that. And I've seen, I have some background knowledge about organizational behavior, industrial psychology, where I've observed it in the investment bank is that, a lot of actually our ex extra knowledge and theories do not actually answer a lot of questions when it comes to people's interaction with intelligence machines or softwares. So um, that makes me uh, pick up the interest in, in studying how interaction with this AI system or software will change people psychologically and behaviorally. And this is uh, this impressed general applied psychology paper is just one of the paper that uh, one of the ideas that uh, was really 100% truly inspired by my on-site observation. And, and I'm a person who always, um, the starting point of all my research projects, especially in this area, in technologies, internet, well, really they were in, uh, focused, or exp uh, focused on and inspired by in-person observations, like how my colleagues react towards interacting with AI. If they interact with AI system more, how would they feel uh, in the rest of the day? How would they, what kind of behaviors they tend to enact afterwards? So that's exactly what I've observed and then they try to put together a model, also have some data mm -hmm. and test. So, so I think that's the starting point of this stream of research as far as my motivation um, uh, for this impress uh, uh, journal of applied psychology paper among the others, yeah. Yeah, well, why don't we well think of think about first the idea of artificial intelligence because when we talk about it when we refer to artificial intelligence either in our studies or in our everyday talk we seem to refer to a really broad kind of a spectrum of applications of artificial intelligence and um, so if we want to categorize artificial intelligence or in your study what kinds of artificial intelligence do you specifically focus on 
Yeah, this is a really good question. It's one that we were always um, challenge <laughs> and ask. So really a question with wisdom. And I would say this is a question that um, a lot of uh, scholars in our area uh, also ask me as well. So I, I, I really, so this is just my personal understanding and insights um, on AI. I think AI, there are so, obviously there's so many different types of AIs, like, you know, AI system that happen in the context of, uh, for example, in auditing firms, auditors, these days they use AI to retrieve data intelligently, efficiently. In a consultants or analysts uh, jobs, like AI is being used to analyze a portfolio, um, company statement. So in, in job like even like biomedical engineers, AI helps them to uh, process medical data, patients' data, and and then to come together a solution to treat a disease in a better way. So I would say all this different kind of artificial intelligence system they varies in their functionalities or mm -hmm. even in the interface. So there are many idiosyncratic differences between the application of AI in different um, uh, contexts or jobs. Uh, it's hard to come to a really uh, uh, you know. Uh, black and white categories to categorize it, but I can tell you one thing for sure is there's a common ground or commonality for all these uh, AI machines. And this is also how I conceptualize it in my ongoing work and working paper is that they at least share the features of machine learning, uh, e being equipped with machine learning capability. They are able to learn uh, from external data. They are able to um, improve over time. They are, processing stuff in a real time manner, provide intelligent and smart output interpretation of data. So this is the common feature of AI that I would say it whole across different kind of contexts, jobs, um, without getting into those uh, idiosyncratic, uh, idiosyncratic differences between each uh, type of AI software. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the most recently, probably we see more of a generative AI applications, so which mm -hmm. provides insights based on, um, so the questions provided or the prompters uh, provided by the users. And yeah. previously, perhaps we focused more on automations or the processes that are uh, involving any machines or any, you know, any non-human elements that provides the people or employees a kind of a feeling of companionship or maybe even uh, I don't know, monetary of your work behaviors. So like robots or any kinds of, you know, those non-human elements. Um, so in the study that we just talked about, so the Journal of Applied Psychology study, you focus on work and after work consequences. Right. Um, right. So how the uses or how working with artificial intelligence is related to our work after work uh, behaviors or uh, experience. Yeah, so um, in our paper, there are actually two different responses among their employees. Um, there one is called adaptive coping mechanism. Another one, so I won't go into details of the mm -hmm. papers of here, course. but I just want to uh, explain the big takeaway of the two reactions, more broadly speaking. So adaptively, people, when they interact with AI, because it's a tool that is in inherently socially de de depriving, so people feel the lack of social connection. So the coping mechanism is actually to cope with that socially isolating feature of interaction with AI with a heightened need to affiliate with other. And, and subsequently, they will enact more pro-social behavior, helping behavior to show that to comp that's a compensatory um, uh, uh, responses. So that's the adaptive function. Uh, and it happens at work. Mm -hmm. But the maladaptive path actually happens after work. So First of all, because of the socially isolating uh, experience of interacting with AI, people feel lonely at work. But this this lonely feeling actually carry over to after work mm. and makes people more likely to drink alcohol afterwards, and they have a problem falling asleep. So there has been a variety of papers suggesting that uh, loneliness make employees remain to be mentally active, uh, activated after work. They keep thinking back about their socially isolating experience. So they, they en engage in maladaptive coping behaviors, like, you know, further escape from the reality. reality. So they drink wine, alcohol, some more alcohol. And they also think about that because they 
they are actually mentally activated, uh, activated, so they have problem falling asleep. So there's a adaptive at work pathway on responses, and the other one is maladaptive at home responses. Yeah, well, I think this really brilliant design, and also it taps into the the both sides of the coin. I mean, the positive and negative, adaptive and maladaptive processes when people are to, um, have when people have artificial intelligence as part of their work. Can we also say that this is also because artificial intelligence, when it's introduced into the workplace, it creates a, a sort of, um, how to say it, emotion and resource depletion process where people should leverage more resources to deal with it. And this can be something that the management or um, any managers should focus on because we, simply focus tend to focus more on skill training or anything that can get employees familiarized with the artificial intelligence however we forget about the emotional uh, reactions or the energy depletion that takes place yeah i mean i think pi research recently they, uh, there are, there's been already research all suggesting that ai is like actually depleting in nature it consumes emotional resources so um, I would say there are a lot of uh, remedies to, to these situations, uh, things that companies can do. For example, they can start from the design of their AI interface, make it more human-like, uh, we call it anthropomorphism, to anthropomorphize their uh, mm. software, to uh, give it a human name, range of many ways to do that, ranging from give, a, give it a human name, equipping it with human voice, to a lot of different kind of social features to, to enrich the social interactions, to make it less boring, uh, and to try to, as a hope, to replenish employees' resources, attentional resources when they use it. So I think the first uh, where management or companies can should start is actually uh, from the design of these tools. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and also, I guess, if you use the robots, <laughs> probably, it's very important to think about not only the functionality of the design, but also how aesthetically and how it creates symbols in the workplace, yeah. which is something perhaps if we don't look at, we will miss a big part uh, in the process of um, employee, non human machine interaction. Um, yeah. This discussion also reminds me of a, another study that you have recently conducted. Um, I don't remember lots of details about the study, but a very important one, a very interesting one is that you look at how um, ping pong players <laughs> interacted with the machines. <laughs> so how it's relevant, I mean, um, what, what is the background of that study? So uh, this is really, you know, like as, as my close friends and co-workers, they know me, I, I used to complete um, and, and one of the very high league in Hong Kong in table tennis. And I've been uh, university representatives uh, in table tennis uh, since high, uh, also in high school. So I, I play, I know a lot of professional full-time players. And, and that comes to a point during COVID, a lot of these table tennis athletes, they have to, because of social isolation policy, they have to conduct training with the table tennis smart machines like so it's basically like a table tennis training robots and that inspired me to think about maybe they should we should um uh, consider a study study to study how actually these professional workers react towards um the implementation of robotic systems so that's that's the starting point of that uh, study and we found that pet people actually when they interact more with robotic uh, training partners uh, with the sample of uh, table tennis athletes, they actually respond with a higher heightened level of passion decay. They 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 reduce their um uh, uh, passion towards their job, their occupation, and then that leads to some withdrawal behavior. So I think this is fascinating because um efficiency comes with a cost, you know, especially in professional occupations like athletes. They they are there for the human connections with the coach, with the training partners, but not with robots. So I, I think honestly, while we are advocating the massive implementation of AI robotics, um, decision makers really have to think about whether 
it actually uh, is, is overwhelmingly beneficial for uh, or equally beneficial for all occupations? I think the answer is no. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. And and let's also talk about the methods of your study. Well, it's, what it seems, of course, from our audiences who are non management majors, they may be surprised or they may be so impressed when they read the management or organizational behavior papers that you always include multiple studies, multiple methods, multiple data in your study. So, so uh, what what is the what what does the OB paper or does the management paper look like if you want to aim for a top journal? I'll say we are going towards uh, this territory of like adopting a mixed method approach. That means uh, simply conducting survey-based study is not enough. We have to combine it with different kind of experiments. For example, online experiments uh, between person experience uh, with uh, manipulation group versus control group. And, and when it comes to manipulation, there are many ways to do it. It can be as a, a vignette, a scenario-based study. It can be graphics. It can be having them go through a task versus not go through a task. It could be simulation. So, uh, uh, so there are so many ways for uh, in terms of like design of online experiment. We, we are now in a field in organizational management or organizational behavior. We really want to go go for a cross validity of your model. That means try to test your model across different kind of design, like even within experiments, like different kind of experimental design. Mm -hmm. And for field study, you know, uh, longitudinal data. Uh, design collection design is, is basically a, a must. Like you know, we have to separate testing the variables across different surfaces uh, with multiple raters. Like that means we cannot, or we should presumably have employees rating their some of the variables and have their supervisor reported some of their behavioral outcomes, something like that. So it has to be all together. You know, like mm. to comprehensively test your theory. Yeah. So, but is, what is your suggestion of selecting multiple data or using mixed methods? So, let's say if we want to know in your journal of uh, applied psychology study, uh, looking at the work and after work consequences of interacting with the artificial intelligence. So, how actually multi data or mixed methods help to validate or to increase the validity of your findings? So, I mean, the, the ex experimental study, for sure, they, they help in a way to establish causality. So, uh, to make sure, you know, your res the responses among the employees, like, um, you know, having heightened need for affiliation and loneliness mm -hmm. are really being caused by their interaction with AI. So, experiment can it really help tease that part out, showing that, you know, AI is actually the interaction of AI is the cause, the triggers of, of this series of uh, responses here. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, like uh, experiment, experimental designs are limited in terms of providing generalizability. Whether, whether this model is actually really working in the field. So that's, that's, the, that's the part we have to conduct a field survey study to provide, to, to hope to provide external validity for your research findings. Mm -hmm. So together with this mixed method, it can provide both internal and external validity of mm -hmm. your findings. So this is uh, what we are pushing for in top management journals these days, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and if, if, speaking of artificial intelligence applications, would also be helpful if we include different kinds of AI applications. So maybe robot in the first study, and then in the second or third study, I look at a different kind of applications so that I can increase the validity of my finding as, as well. Yeah, that's exactly what you will ask for. Uh, <laughs> and that's exactly what I've done in, in uh, my Academy, Academy of Management Journal published last year. Mm -hmm. We examine our findings and model across three different types of intelligence machines, robot, uh, algorithm software, and our own uh, program, program that um, AI assistant mm. uh, uh, simulation experiment. So, yeah. So I think that's 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 a fair point, and 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 obviously uh, that resonates back to what I've suggested earlier. I think the the the, the key takeaway is that intelligence machines they share common features, no matter what kind of idiosyncratic features each of them 
have. But I think one thing that uh, we should bear in mind is that a lot of these applications, they are actually intelligent in nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically the common feature that you talk about is human beings thinking of machines having something really like human beings, like intelligence, like when they respond, they would respond in a way like real human. Yeah, I mean, yeah, mostly. Uh, most of it, yes. Uh, I mean, you can never expect intelligence machines to respond like human. They, mm -hmm. they're, they're going to be, um, I would say, socially underwhelming uh, experience. But at least they can resemble the level of uh, responsiveness or intelligence. Like they can come back with a lot of responses, useful information, and with a really relatively short period of time. So I, I mean, like there, there, there are aspects of the communication that AI is actually better than human, but in terms of response time, right? But again, like, you know, like social feature wise, AI can never be better than human at this, at least at this point of time. Yeah, and generative AI may change that. I mean, it, yeah. it, it, it's now designed to look at like more human, human, human like responses or to generate insights that can really go beyond the for instance common sense or maybe they can also give you some insights inspirations so yeah. perhaps Agreed. that will make a change yeah 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 i think that that a lot of my studies most of my studies that we have we haven't we even have the chance to cover generative ai yes so that will be a good next um exploratory direction to study for, for, for people who are interested in this area of research yeah yeah. So, so my last set of questions will be related to the research life. So perhaps now it's a good opportunity to go behind the curtain to see what is happening in your research life. So um, let's begin with the question about challenge. So about your research, about those studies that we talked about, what would you say are the challenges that you encountered or what are the most painstaking moments when you are conducting these studies? I would say not only the samples are really hard to find when it comes to AI research, but I would say we reverse are, are very actually not very in general, not very on board with um, studying this human AI interaction in our discipline because uh, it's really new, really new. Like, I mean, there are a lot of recently published a paper in this area, but like still it's, it's a relatively nascent uh, area of research that is emerging and there's no consensus on on how to define AI, for example. And so I have to craft everything from the beginning. I have to read a lot of papers from, you know, the, the, uh, the information system literature. I have to read a lot of papers from a psychology literature to get a sense of how to create consensus in a field. So I, 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 I can't conclude whether right I have created consensus, but at least I think I have some of my papers have changed some conversation in my field about how people define AI, how people will pursue uh, a set of studies um, uh, in our, to try to publish in top journals. So I'll, I'll say that the hardest part of it is at, at the very beginning, because I'm one of the very few uh, scholars at that time, back a few years ago, who study AI. So the challenge is to really, really find an anchoring point. I would say come create a consensus because no one's on board in, in those amongst the reviewers at the time. Mm -hmm. and, and I think your track record just to show is a great testimonial that you help mm -hmm. to shape this uh, area of research. You are setting the tone for the future directions of the research in this area. That's definitely for sure. And um, so in your research life, I mean, again, because our audiences, perhaps many of our audiences are not from management or organizational behavior fields. Uh, most of them are from communication right. or sociology. So what is it like to work in a business school? <laughs> this is a general question, but what, what does it look like? What does it feel like? So I, I would say it's, it's competitive for sure, because uh, what i am been teaching is actually organizational behavior, human resources practices. And these are the studies or, or subjects of studies with a lot of theories. 
So um, in order to really make your classes more entertaining, interesting, um, I, I, I try very hard to incorporate some, some real life examples, case studies, um, even some, some, something I have, cause I've been in touch with my friends in the industries, like the most of the most latest updates, updated application in their company, um, that actually, you know, is relevant to this theory in this course. So that's kind of thing is the most challenging part is really to, cause we are in the business school, so we have to connect real world phenomenon with the book knowledge, with knowledge in the book. And that's one of their, I mean, it's one of the challenging part of working in business school is like, you can't just go in, teach the theories and call it a day. You really need to enlighten your students by connecting what they've been learning mm -hmm. with real world examples. Like basically I have to keep up with the news every week just to see, is there any news popping up this morning? Which is relevant to what I'm going to teach you tomorrow this afternoon. So I think uh, we have to have a really strong learning goal orientation in business school, working in business school. Mm. And how about research? Because um, we go way back, and uh, when when I took a course of organizational behaviors, I was so <laughs> surprised, and then I was so uh, struck by how much work that usually my <laughs> study involves and how long it can take to publish an article, especially in a top journal. Yeah, I would say average time, at least two, three years, that's the average time. Um, some people may be faster. Some of my paper did publish faster, like in a year and a half, but that's not common. Mm -hmm. Our review process is extremely demanding. So, I mean, I can't speak for other discipline. Uh, even in business school, but at least in organizational behavior is a very tiring process. So um, it's definitely challenging, um, time consuming. So that's why I would say when it comes to research, research life, I would say I immediately think about what are the buffering, stress buffering activities that I would do. You know, I, I really need to zoom out from my work for at least two days a week, just to make sure I have enough energy to re-engage with those Revise and resubmit, um, you know, addressing reverse comments. So I, I think our my life on average is pretty much is pretty stressful for five days a week. But then two days, like don't care about work at all, and uh, and and do the stuff that I think can be stress relieving, can be a personal hobbies, can be getting getting with our friends. So I, that's my research life. I would say it's extremely challenging, stressful, but yeah. I create a room for myself, um, uh, try to save myself from it. Yeah. <laughs> so how many papers do you have in your pipeline usually? Or what would you suggest if you want to be successful in uh, on a tenure track as a system professor and to be promoted to associate professor? And how many, wh what is the usual workload? How many papers you have in the in your pipeline usually? This is, this is a wonderful question. And obviously, obviously this matters differently for different people, right? I mean, different yes. people may have different capacity. So um, I've been asked this question so many times, my answer is always the same. And it's exactly the same my advisor told me in my first year of study. Uh, number is golden number of free active research. So what does that mean? Basically these people are in active research, like revise and resubmit, uh, actively writing up or yeah. So it's, it's just like, at most only focus on free papers mm -hmm. that you will be actively focusing on. Like you can have stuff at the side, collecting data, brainstorming, literature review, ready to start writing. That kind of things can, can line up. And, and that I can't tell the numbers because it it really you know um, varies across different people. For, for me, I always focus on free projects, top projects, and I'll rank order them. That's my number. I, I would not maintain more than three active projects at the same time because that according to my advisor is counterproductive. So <laughs> I think this really, this tip is really helpful because that's exactly what I've been giving to juniors as well and uh, and sharing with others. So I think this is the way to go. I mean, it's for me. Yeah. 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 Good. So for three active projects, you mean three projects you are leading, right? So that does not count the projects that are evolving in. So perhaps there are other projects. I mean, I mean, 
Yeah, it could be project that you're a second offer because second offer can handle those lots of stuff. Like sometimes second offer have to write a half of the paper or conduct all the analysis. So I would say among those three, at least one or two of them could be a second offer. Mm. And for sure, one or two of them is a leading offer paper. Yeah, that, that's how I, I, I would say, yeah. And then that's how you can also find a balance and use your energy in a more intelligent way because if you focus yeah. one more, and two more, basically, you don't have the sufficient energy that you can be effective in that project. So Absolutely. Perhaps it's a great number. I have, I was told there, there are more numbers, like five or even seven. It, it sounds really crazy because you cannot simply focus on that many projects when you have just a, you know, a, a certain amount of energy every day. <laughs> so it's really- um, Yeah, I think this is absolutely, so I think my advisor, is a very wise person, obviously. So he told me one thing that I, I keep reminding myself and also share about it's like, the most productive scholar is not those who can start a project. It's those who can close the loop. So if you want to start a project, you can start for 50 projects, 60 projects today. But whether you can close the loop or not is a question, right? So so that's the reason why he, he he advised me very strongly to maintain the, the optimal number to be three because like that's where you can close the loop that's the number yeah mm. and and but but for junior scholars sometimes it's difficult to choose the right project so what would you suggest maybe for um phd students for their first project the very first project in their academic career, or maybe the very first project when they kick off kick off their job as a system professor, how to choose the first project or the the, the first few projects? So uh, there are a few things here actually. So first of all, I have two advisors. One of my another advisor told me that never work as a doctoral student, never work on a project without a senior. A senior person that that who is coach who's been coaching you consistently, so that I follow that advice. Like like all of my projects that I've started in my doctoral studies, they have, either one of my advisors they're on it. So the reason is because they could provide you a good judgment call about whether this project is well fit to pursue further yeah. and to be included in that numbers of three. And you know you need a lot of mentorship in terms of acquiring the ideas and working along the way. So my advice is like, you know, work with the, the mentor that has been guiding you very closely, at least for the first few projects. Make sure you get a sense of what to do, how to do. Um, don't do things that, you know, starting a project among, that's just my personal opinion. There, there, there's no right and wrong answer, obviously, but like, among only doctoral students or without seniors or, or, or trustworthy mentors, that could be a maybe a waste of time because you need a, a really, a really, uh, you know, very good uh, trustworthy scholar to give you good insights to to make important decisions. I think decision making is very important. You can um, um, PhD students or even assistant professors they're on the clock for tenure, so you can afford to waste extra times on more than few projects that have no potential. So I will always, um, before we, I will definitely consult my advisors or seniors. Even these days, I, will, I keep in touch with my advisors. I talk a lot with some senior scholars when I want to make a big decision of, do, uh, should we still proceed with this paper or, or no? something like that. Those. Yeah, I think junior scholars or even doctoral students have to be very sensitive to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Always reach out for suggestions, advices yeah. for making the big yeah. decision, like the theoretical directions or the methodological choices of the papers, uh, yeah. especially in early years, because yeah. you don't also get, you, not only you get useful suggestions, but perhaps you will save lots of time. In, yeah. in, the, in the later stages, right? Exactly. Yeah. So let's end by my final question. I have this question in mind earlier when you talk about uh, research taking so many years to publish and also your teaching. So you want to keep updated about what is happening in the business world so that you can teach more effectively. Yeah. Um, 
So given that research in OB and management takes so many years to publish, how studies can keep up with the trends or the practices in the business world. So how the knowledge produced by the academia or from management or OB be useful after even several years? How, how do you keep up with the trend? So I think the first, really, really, the first um, thing to do, even before thinking about the time frame, is to better connect academic knowledge with practitioner's practice. What I've been doing is, I, I, if you look at my CV, I wrote some blog posts, right? I try to publicize my findings and write them in a layman way so managers can have some quick takeaway of my findings so they know what to do. So that's the first thing. And then we, uh, after doing that, there may be a question about how to inform managers timely of your findings. So this is a really, really challenging question. And I, I don't really have a, an absolutely correct answer to um, to handle this. But what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting is that even for me, when I test a phenomenon, it's not exactly what, also you have seen 100% X predict to M and Y, so you're going to you're going to test that. It's more about you have to forward looking a little bit. That's what I've been doing. When I test the model, like I've been doing this AI stream of research since 2018, five years ago, no one talked about AI, but I, I, I've seen that in some industry. So I start forward looking. And so I think, so that's why it's a successful management scholar. You need to have a strong focus and vision about future. Because you have to obviously be imaginative. Um, um, that has to go along the fact that you're being really good observer, observe a good phenomenon and, and fast forward a little bit. So I'm not saying that this is this must be the rep, re, recipe for being successful in our field, but I would say, at least for me, it works well. I, I think it's a tips um, even for people working in the area of organizational communications, uh, to think about what would be some potential um, organizational phenomenon that may happen. What, are, what would be the new ways for CEO to communicate some kind of messages? And, and then fast, fast forward a little bit and, and try to try to see is there room to test the phenomenon. I, I think as a scholar, we have to be. The craziest part of this job is like you have to be understand you have to understand the past literature very well <laughs> to find room to contribute. But you also have to understand the current state of what's going on in the real world. And next, you have to start forward thinking. So you basically have to be an all-rounded uh, person who know the past, current, and predict the future. That's the <laughs> I would say that's the conclusion of being as you know, if you want to be a prolific management scholar, you have to equip with all this you know, temporal orientation. So <laughs> yeah, it's demanding, I know. <laughs> All right. I really love how we end this interview. So scholars as time travelers. <laughs> travelers, time past. travelers. Love it, yes. Yes, dealing with the past, looking at the present and predicting the future. Maybe that's the, maybe that's the heading of the, of the, 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 of the interview. Of the, yes. Creative the headings, creative uh, ties. <laughs> yeah, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your time, Jackie. Okay, take care. Have a good day. Yeah.